I really want to welcome everybody here today. Uh, it's great to see so many people have joined us from across the world. Um, thank you for making the time and the effort to join us. On behalf of Emergency Nutrition Network, or ENN, uh, UNICEF and Save the Children, I'm delighted to welcome you to this event. Uh, we want to give grateful thanks to Ireland's Department for Foreign Affairs for supporting this event. As you can see, there's lots of people have joined and it, the level of interest here is, is, I think, a reflection of our understanding of the critical importance of this period of life, uh, both for adolescents' own health and well-being, as well as, of course, for future generations. Now, we've all been through this period, uh, some of us in, uh, much more recently than others. I'm not saying anything about how long ago it was for me. Um, so I'm sure we can all remember what a time of excitement and uncertainty it was as we tried to find our place in the world. It's importantly, it's a time for establishing lifelong habits. And that's why it's so critical to try and encourage and de develop healthy ones during this period. So with more attention coming towards adolescents and young people in general, both at national and also international level and communities, um, that's across donors, researchers, programmers, um, it's clear that while there is some evidence, and the evidence is of course building all the time, there are still so many gaps in our understanding. Some of these gaps include what the actual scale of the problem is regarding malnutrition in this age group, and we'll hear a little bit about that in a moment. Um, another gap is what interventions or activities will help to improve nutritional status within this group. Um, also a major gap is what adolescents actual lived experiences around access to and understanding of good nutrition and we'll hear some great uh, research that uh, has been, was conducted in Indonesia today. Also a, a major gap is how to meaningfully engage young people in devising and delivering the necessary solutions and for that reason the uh, I'm really looking forward to the youth panel that we've got after the break today, where we're going to hear from, from, some, from some very dynamic young people um, about what they think. So we're taking this opportunity to come together across our common interests, and we're going to be working towards two objectives outlined for this meeting. So the first one is to share some information on, on some of the latest research and operational initiatives in adolescent nutrition. And the second one is to explore priorities for assessing and improving adolescent nutrition across policies and programmes. So we're very well aware that the second objective in particular is quite ambitious for a relatively short virtual event, but we're hoping that we can make at least some progress towards it. So this is a virtual event uh, by necessity. The COVID-19 pandemic has made sure that uh, none of us can meet in person for a while. Um, and of course, there's advantages and disadvantages. There's pros and cons to virtual events. Uh, the major advantage is for increasing access. And you can see by how many people of you, how many people are listening in across the world. And that probably wouldn't be possible in an in-person event. The downside though is that time is shorter than it would be face to face. We can't keep people on Zoom all day. Um, so we're not, as, we're not able to share as much as we'd like to. Uh, we're also quite conscious that everybody's a bit Zoom fatigued um, over this period. Uh, less travel and movement, we're all online all day instead. So we've kept the agenda quite brief to two afternoons and a relatively brief schedule. But this does mean um, that we can't cover very much and a number of critically important areas we're not going to have time to to cover and these are for example um, issues surrounding early marriage quite a few questions have come in on the advanced questions surrounding early marriage and pregnancy in adolescent girls and what that means for their nutritional status um, so we're not going to cover them in the meeting but what we hope to do is that we will answer some of these questions or try and point you to the some resources or whatever um, after the event in a meeting report and also that we will post some of the questions on Ennet and you'll hear a bit more from my colleague Stephanie later about that option. Um, we do hope that you're going to find the event interesting though and that you will actively participate by posting comments and questions in the chat box. We have people monitoring the chat box both days so we hope that you will keep interacting with us. 
A little bit of housekeeping. So during the meeting, only the presenters and panelists will have their audio and video on. Everybody else's audio and video will stay off. We will be recording both days of the meeting and we're going to be uploading it onto the Media Hub section of ENN's website um, and contact any of us if you need help with that. We also hope to load most of the any of the presentations that are given over this couple of days onto the website, but we won't be loading the first presentation that Ian and are giving. And the reason for that is that most of the results are quite, they're just early results. We just want to share some early findings and they haven't yet been peer reviewed or published. So we won't be posting those. If you engage with social media, do please feel free to tweet or use Facebook or Instagram or whatever medium it is you use, um, because the more people we can reach out to and involve in our discussions and listen to the messages, the better. As you log off at the end of each day, there will be a few short questions. You'll be directed to a few short questions um, that we are asking if you could give some reflection on the meeting. Uh, we'd be really grateful if you could fill this in because it will help us to hear your thoughts and, uh, you know, ways to improve for future meetings. So on with today, uh, the agenda for today is that we will have two presentations to start off with. Um, firstly, we will have a presentation from ENN, and then we will have a presentation from Dee Jupp, who's been working with Empatica. After both the presentations, uh, we will have a question, question and answer session where you've either asked some questions in advance that we'll try to answer or in the chat box to the presenters. We'll then have a short break, um, but do please feel free to keep your connection live, especially if you've got a good one. Um, we'll just uh, have audio and video of everybody off during that period. After the break, we're then going on to a very exciting part of uh, I'll introduce the participants of our youth panel discussion. So we've got four incredibly dynamic young people and we're gonna be able to hear firsthand from them what they think about uh, the nutritional status of adolescents and what we should all be doing about it. In order to try and make this event a little more participatory rather than just uh, sitting there listening to us on Zoom, at the start of some of the presentations or perhaps in the middle, we'll, we might be asking a, a multiple choice question for you to answer. So obviously this isn't compulsory, but um, just we're trying to make it a bit more interesting. Um, so do please feel free to put your answer in and then the Zoom poll will show up with the with the answers and you can see how well you've done. So I think that's everything now. Um, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to hand over to my uh, brilliant colleagues at ENN. It's Natasha Lelivald and Stephanie Rottersley. We've been working together over the past couple of years um, uh, doing quite a lot of work on looking at adolescent nutrition and so they're going to describe what we've been doing uh, setting the scene for us by giving us an overview of adolescent, sorry, adolescent malnutrition across seven global regions. So handing over to Tash and Steph now. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Um, okay, here we are kicking off with the first presentation um, of this to afternoon meeting. I'll just um, share my screen so I can show you our slides. Um, yes, here we are. So, oh, well. um, my name is Natasha Lillipat. I don't know the work we've been undertaking as ENN over the past year on um, mapping the current global burden of policy, uh, the current global burden policies and evidence related to adolescent nutrition. My colleague Stephanie Rottersley will be presenting the second half of the presentation. So I'll just start with some background information. Um, a lot of us on this call know that adolescence is an extremely important time um, in, with regard to nutrition and development. However, there has been less focus on understanding and improving the nutritional status of adolescents um, and also children over the age of five, so school-aged children, compared to perhaps the focus that we see in children under five or the first 1,000 days of life. However, adolescence is a period of really rapid physical, emotional and behavioural growth, similar to that of the first 1,000 days. So it does warrant um, a kind of a huge amount of attention. Nutrition in adolescence can influence adult health and behaviours, 
the health of future offspring, particularly in girls. It can influence your adult productivity and even the national economic growth of a country. So it's really important. And yet we don't have clear consensus on the definitions on the burden. And when I say burden, I'm talking about just the, the proportion of adolescents who are suffering from malnutrition um, or on effective interventions. So we are really trying to um, encourage in the nutrition community that work with adolescents to come together and find consensus on these things. As a starting point, uh, last year ENN undertook this mapping exercise, as I've said, um, and we used a number of different methods to kind of summarize where we currently are with regard to evidence and what we currently know. So we have undertaken an updating of prevalence data using latest DHS surveys. We conducted an online stakeholder survey to understand what people working in this area know and think. And um, we conducted some systematic literature reviews to summarize the evidence uh, across the different UNICEF regions. So I'll start by presenting our findings from the update of the prevalence data using the DHS survey. So we very much built on this great report that was um, written by Benedict et al in 2018 with uh, uh, USAID. And we updated that um, this um, with any more recent surveys up until 2020. And this is what we've uh, found with regard to the prevalence of stunting in adolescent girls, 15 to 19 years. So defined as height for age Z score less than minus two um, using the WHO reference. And as you can see, the highest um, prevalence of stunting is in uh, South Asia, and also there's high prevalences in uh, East and Southern Africa. This is uh, the current picture for thinness in adolescent girls based on BMI for age that's got less than minus two. Um, again, high prevalences in South Asia and also in West Africa. Okay, now we come to our first uh, question for you guys. Um, so let's hope that this Zoom poll works. Um, Laura, would you put up the question? Great. So if you vote, uh, what low middle income country do you think has the highest rates of overweight and obesity in adolescent girls? And this is based on our DHS data. There is um, obviously a bit of variation depending on what data you use. Um, but we'll just give you 30 seconds to submit a question. It's it's all just anonymous. No one's checking whether you got it right. <laughs> Let me know when you're when uh, have we done 30 seconds, Laura? We can close the poll and um what was the answers? Okay, so the majority fought South Africa, but still quite um, a spread across each of them. So let's see. Um, this is our data for the overweight. Um, and the answer was actually Jordan has the highest prevalence. Almost 60% of adolescent girls fall into the overweight or obesity category there, uh, which is huge. And then um, all similarly high in Egypt and uh, closely followed by South Africa there with 33% uh, and also high, high prevalences in Latin America. So over a quarter of adolescents in Bolivia and Peru uh, categorized as overweight or obese. Um, so yeah, that was the, the uh, prevalence data. And um, in going through this, we were just reminded of some of the issues of using anthropometry to quantify burden in adolescence. Um, we found a lack of disaggregated survey data. So a lot of the uh, national large scale surveys do tend to put adolescents in with adult data. Uh, for example, 15 to 49 years might be a category. So it makes it quite difficult to know what is going on with adolescents. 
Um, we also found that um, a lot of different surveys and studies use a variety of references. So there's the CDC reference, the WHO, the IOTF reference, all commonly used. And they, uh, depending on what reference you use, you get a slightly different picture of how prevalent uh, a type of malnutrition is. Um, and especially uh, different if you use different Z-score cutoffs. So, for example, the WHO suggests you, uh, thinness as any, um, any score less than minus two Z-scores, whereas IOTF suggests thinness as any score less than minus one, um, which makes quite a big difference to your numbers. There's also the timing of the adolescent growth spurt to consider, which varies by individual, obviously, and also just um, by population. So this um, affects how relevant a reference might be uh, for an individual or for a population and whether or not that adolescent has gone through their growth spurt at the average time or slightly later or slightly earlier. Um, there's also the consideration of what is a global health issue. So what cutoff should we have with regard to Z scores? These should really reflect functional and health implications. Uh, and this also varies by region. So for example, the WHO do provide the option to use a lower BMI cutoff for defining risk associated overweight in Asian context, because um, uh, uh, you might be less overweight than an adolescent in another context, um, yet you're more at risk of NCDs in an Asian context. So. Um, that's another kind of complexity that we need to just remember when we're thinking about this anthropometry data. And um, lastly, I'm going to show a few maps that show that um, the difference that you see if you apply adult BMI cutoffs to adolescent data rather than using Z scores, which happens quite commonly. Uh, even the DHS reports tend to um, report prevalences of adolescents using BMI categories that are made for adults rather than adolescents. Um, so this is the prevalence map for thinness that I showed earlier using the WHO reference. And then this is the map, the same map, same data, but using adult BMI cutoffs. And you can see if I flick back to the first one and then the second one, it, it's a lot a lot darker green, almost all the countries fall into the highest category of thinness when you apply adult data, um, BMI cutoffs to them. And then I've got the same um, for overweight and obesity. This is using the WHO um, BMI for age Z score data. And then this one is using the adult BMI. <coughs> so I just flip between those and uh, it gets, uh, the map gets a lot lighter because um, you tend to uh, underestimate how many overweight or obese adolescents you have if you apply uh, adult BMI cutoffs to adolescents. So that's just um, another important issue to consider with anthropometry. And if we had better indicators of diet adequacy, diet diversity to go alongside this anthropometry data, we might get a much better picture of what's happening with adolescents and we need those better indicators we need research to develop those and um, we also need simple and standardized anthropometry to kind of minimize a lot of this noise that we get in the data there's there's enough issues already associated with it we should at least be standardized Now moving on to the results of our stakeholder survey and, and quite a lot of those thoughts that I just discussed were also reiterated by stakeholders who completed our online survey. Uh, we asked them um, to give their views on what they know of uh, research policy and programs with regard to adolescent nutrition. And we got 133 people who completed the whole survey and uh, they represented 42 countries. So we got a really good geographic representation. Respondents reported uh, that most of the research they were aware of was on undernutrition and micronutrient deficiencies and less on overweight obesity and dietary patterns. Most of the respondents were working in low and middle income countries. So it perhaps uh, reflects their kind of focus of their work or the, the research that they're reading. But it's really important that low middle income countries are also considering overweight and obesity and research into that area for adolescents considering the um, burdens I just recently presented. 
Um, with regard to policies, uh, respondents reported that most policies, again, tend to focus on micronutrient status and undernutrition. Also, some policies focus on diet, but fewer focus on overweight and obesity for adolescents. Respondents also highlighted key policy gaps that we need to think about, such as the lack of adolescent specific targets in the World Health Assembly nutrition targets, the lack of adolescent targets in the sustainable development goals. So, of course, adolescent girls are mentioned in um, goal 2.2, uh, but there isn't a specific target for adolescents. Um, a lack of nutrition, or, uh, sorry, a lack of national level adolescent nutrition targets again, and this actually hinders the inclusion of adolescents in national surveys because we don't have targets that we're reaching for anyway. And the widespread exclusion of adolescents from health and nutrition guidelines. And the uh, full results of this mapping uh, online survey can be found on the ENM website and a report we have already published. We also asked respondents whether they have a defined age bracket for adolescents uh, that they use as part of their work. And we found that 77% uh, said they did have a, a definition with regard to age of adolescents, but almost 20% said they didn't have a definition. Um, and among the ones that did have a definition, there was quite a broad range of ages suggested um, that they use. Uh, most, the majority, well, not the majority, but the most commonly suggested age range was similar to the WHO, or the same as the WHO, one 10 to 19 years, but we got uh, ranging from nine years to 24 years, lots of different categories in between, um, which uh, kind of does make it a lot more difficult to standardize across uh, research policies and programs when we don't have a baseline standard definition of what we're talking about with regard to adolescents. So um, that's another area where standardization needs to be improved. And lastly, we asked um, stakeholders to identify data gaps with regard to adolescent nutrition, and we were able to categorize the responses into these seven themes. Um, so they identified a lack of data on diets and adolescent knowledge of healthy diets, a lack of indicators of malnutrition and targets for improvement, a lack of evidence on interventions that work and how to reach adolescents. A lack of adolescent voices in designing solutions. Lack of research funding, especially for longer term cohort type studies. A lack of data on subgroups, so out of school adolescents, males, refugees and adolescents in emergency contexts. And uh, lastly, a lack of inclusion and age disaggregation within survey data, which um, has come up several times already. Okay, I'm now going to hand over to Steph. She has another question for you to start with. Great, thanks, Tash. So, um, yeah, we have a, to kick off this part of the presentation. We have one more question for you, which is what low and middle income country do you think has the most published studies on adolescent nutrition? And to answer this question, seven comprehensive literature reviews have been conducted for low and middle income countries in seven world regions as defined by UNICEF. Six of these were conducted by ENN and one by the UNICEF Europe and Central Asia Regional Office. And the aim of this review um, was to look at all published studies that describe the burden of adolescent malnutrition in the world regions, as well as interventions aiming to improve nutrition in the adolescent period. And just to note that we included all studies that looked at school age um, children and adolescents, so five to 19 years, because we're aware that um, the school age children are also um, quite understudied. And also we included um, studies that were conducted and published in an not in English, so French, um, if they, and others, if they met the inclusion criteria. Um, we're currently pulling these together into an overall review across the seven regions, but we wanted to highlight some initial takeaways um, coming out of the review process, particularly around data availability and interventions on adolescent nutrition. So if we, um, Look now in the next slide and um, see what you all answered 
um, in the poll question. Uh, so you can see from the poll that the majority of you um, thought that India had the most published studies on adolescent nutrition. And if we go to the next slide, you will see that this is correct. So um, we have the most available evidence from um, India in the South Asia region. Um, with India having 144 studies on adolescent nutrition, um, equating to 271 studies for the South Asia region. But if you look at the other countries in the region, all of these had fewer than 40 studies. Um, next slide. If we look at the West and um, Central Africa region, there was a total of 241 studies. Most of these were conducted in Nigeria at 96 studies, followed by Ghana at 49. And the rest of the countries all had fewer than 20 studies, um, with three countries having no um, available research. Next slide. Um, in the East Asia and Pacific region, there were 195 studies in total. Um, most of these were from Malaysia, and there were nine countries that had no um, available data. Next slide. In the Europe and Central Asia region, um, which I mentioned, um, that review was conducted by the UNICEF ECA regional office. Um, that um, review showed that there were 157 studies in total. The majority of these were from Turkey, um, with seven countries having no studies. Um, next slide. Um, for the Eastern and Southern Africa region, there was a total of 153 studies. Most of these were done in Ethiopia at 51, and in South Africa at 44 studies, with seven countries having no available studies. Next slide. Um, in, for the Middle East and North Africa region, uh, the most studies were conducted in Iraq, and there was a total of 124 studies for the region, with three countries having no data. And next slide. Finally, for the Latin America and Caribbean region, there were only 90 studies available um, in that region, with 20 countries having no uh, studies at all, and most of the studies conducted were in Brazil. So that just really highlights um, how much gaps we have across countries and regions of, around adolescent nutrition. So if we look a bit closely, closer at the intervention studies found during this review, um, overall there was limited evidence from intervention studies across the global regions. Most interventions took place in Latin America and the Caribbean, in East Asia and the Pacific region, and in South Asia. There was limited intervention data from Africa, especially in Eastern and Southern Africa, as well as in the Middle East and North Africa region. And where interventions did exist, only a few countries were represented per region. So for example, in the region with the most intervention studies, which was Latin America and the Caribbean, two thirds of the interventions took place in Mexico and Brazil. Most interventions targeted micronutrient deficiencies via fortification or supplementation. Um, some also targeted under or over nutrition through education and behavior change interventions. And the majority of these studies had a singular focus with a little acknowledgement of the wider spectrum of the nutrition challenges faced by adolescents and the benefits of double duty actions. And um, most nutrition interventions targeted adolescents in school, with some incorporating other stakeholders into the intervention program, such as parents and or teachers. Next slide. Looking a bit more closely at the micronutrient interventions, there was um, most of these focused on reducing anemia prevalence and or on iron deficiency, with some also either focusing alone or incorporating other micronutrient deficiencies such as iodine, uh, vitamin A deficiency and vitamin D deficiency. Most aim to address these deficiencies using fortification, either of staples such as wheat or um, through fortified biscuits or milk or water, 
or through supplements, and some use diet-based strategies such as promoting consumption of micronutrient-rich foods like green leafy vegetables. And some key considerations that were highlighted when looking at these interventions were um, that there's a strong focus on iron fortification and supplementation. And um, some studies compare the effects of using iron alone with multiple micronutrient supplementation. Um, but there's still real question around um, whether to use multiple micronutrient supplementation or single micronutrients. And although some studies that compare single micronutrients with multi micronutrients approaches suggest a benefit of multi micronutrient supplementation, the single nutrient approaches continue to be used and there's a lack of consensus on the best approach to use in adolescents. There's also a lack of comparability between studies on the duration and dose of supplementation or fortified foods, making it difficult to understand what works in adolescents. And um, studies tended to assess outcomes in the short term with little understanding of longer term benefits um, or implications of micronutrient interventions. Next slide. So if we look at the education and behavior change interventions, uh, these used um, either targeted under or over nutrition, and this was context dependent um, on the burden of malnutrition in a respective country or region. And they used a range of approaches, including leaflets, in-person education, um, some group learning and workshops or interactive based approaches, such as cooking classes, and um, some also incorporated physical activity or exercise programs into the interventions. Um, the multi-level programs, um, which included education, um, diet, physical activity, and also tackled issues around food environment, built environment, seemed most effective. And successful programs also often involved other stakeholders, such as parents and teachers within the intervention programs. Um, there was evidence from the interventions on improved knowledge around nutrition, but mixed results for either behavior change or physical outcomes, such as growth or weight outcomes. And um, it's important to note that um, a lot of these outcomes were assessed um, over a short time period. So it's actually quite unlikely in some cases that you would achieve growth or weight outcomes. So we also need to think about how we're assessing our interventions. Um, there's also limited evidence on the use of novel approaches to engage in adolescents, such as social media platforms or game-based more interactive approaches. Um, and the key considerations highlighted here were that we really need to look at more enabling environments and um, whether adolescents can accessibly make changes in behavior and also at what drives adolescent behavior change and um, the practicality versus the efficacy of interventions. So um, some of these interventions use very intensive approaches, which focus on um, what, a lot of one-to-one -one counseling and support of um, adolescents, and we, but we need some larger scale um, practical interventions that can be scaled up across countries and regions. Next slide. So overall from these literature reviews, um, some of the key evidence gaps that were highlighted were that there's a lack of data on undernutrition and micronutrient deficiencies across the regions. And despite the fact that many existing interventions target anemia and iron deficiency, um, there's limited data on the prevalence of micronutrient deficiencies. And we really need to be considering these um, going forward and across the spectrum of adolescent malnutrition as they tend to persist in low and middle income countries, even as overweight and obesity prevalence rises. Uh, there's a rising prevalence of overweight, overweight and obesity, but minimal strategies in place to curb this. Um, inconsistencies in measurements and definitions of malnutrition in adolescents make comparisons difficult. The lack of comparable data across countries and regions, um, also across the wide age range of adolescents, um, looking at differences between the sexes and also settings um, such as rural and um, urban settings. 
Um, there's limited evidence on drivers behind malnutrition, which is essential um, if we're going to design effective interventions. And um, there is just very limited data on um, interventions and a lack of understanding on what works and how best to target adolescents. So the next slide. So just to look at some of the work that we are planning um, to try and address some of these gaps. Um, this year, we're going to be undertaking a research prioritization exercise using the Child Health and Nutrition Research Initiative or CHINRI approach. And this um, will map out a framework of priorities in adolescent nutrition to inform the research community, invested national governments and policymakers. We have an adolescent interest group, which is an informal network of around 75 individuals and representatives from organizations, including UN and donor organizations, NGOs and academic institution, institutions. And this provides a platform for people to share experiences. And um, people are very, from this call are very welcome to join um, that group. And you, just, you can just contact us at ENN um, because ENN is currently coordinating this group um, with a representative hosting quote, quarterly calls. And going forward, we'd really like to collaborate further to address some of the gaps highlighted um, in this mapping exercise that we've undertaken. There's also an adolescent NNET page on the NNET forum, which is a free and open resource to provide field practitioners with access to prompt technical advice for operational challenges. And we hope to engage um, with the adolescent NNET platform more in the future. And we encourage people to join that community and ask any questions or share experiences. Um, on the platform, we have a few expert moderators who respond to questions, and we also encourage peers to respond to each other. And um, we will be using this platform to discuss some of the questions coming out of this webinar um, if we don't have time to cover them in detail here. So if you go to the link um, on this slide, um, you will see the instructions of how to sign up to this platform and you can engage in those conversations there. We're also going to be um, putting out a field exchange special issue on adolescent nutrition. So if we can have the next slide. Um, for those who don't know, Field Exchange is an established technical publication that's produced three times a year by ENN, and there's an annual special edition to complement the routine online and print editions, and this year that is going to be on um, adolescent nutrition. And um, we really love to encourage people to engage with that and to contribute to the special edition. So um, we'd love to hear about program experiences and recent research on adolescent nutrition, especially focusing on experience from countries or agencies that have restructured policies and programs to include um, adolescents. Any examples of multi-sector programs for adolescent nutrition, experiences of youth engagement around adolescent nutrition, the use of innovative approaches and new media such as social media platforms, and um, also research into the structural drivers of adolescent malnutrition, as well as any experiences of adapting adolescent programs for COVID-19 and lessons learned. So we will be sending further information out of, about this via email, but you can also feel free to contact us if you're interested in contributing to this special issue. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tash and Steph, for a very interesting presentation. Um, we have lots of questions and comments coming in the chat box, um, but when you post them, could you please post them for all panelists and attendees? There's different selections at the bottom if you use the drop down menu because then, because uh, our answers aren't making sense because um, everybody can't see the questions. Um, so if when you're posting a question, you um, select the all panelists and attendees, then everybody can see your questions and our answers will make more sense. Um, that's really great. Thank you so much. Fascinating presentation. Um, we will uh, be asking questions at the end of both presentations. Um, so 
uh, it was a very technical presentation, which was great. Uh, we're going to take a little bit of a, um, a different road now, um, as Dr. D. Jupp is going to um, describe her experience. So just as way of introduction, uh, D. has been working for nearly 40 years in participative, sorry, participatory development and remains passionate about people-centered research and creating new ways to include people's voices, perspectives and lived reality. So since 2007, she's focused on using immersive qualitative research, which we'll hear about now, um, to deepen understanding of context and insights on the complexities of behaviour change. At the moment, she's advising Empatica, which is a small people-centred research and training organisation based in Indonesia. So Dee was originally from the UK, but has lived and worked for extensive periods in, in many other countries across Asia, the Caribbean and Africa. So uh, I will hand over to Dee now, who is going to to uh, talk us through uh, her research. Thank you very much, Emily, and uh, thank you very much indeed for having the opportunity to do this. Um, I'm going to share my screen, uh, I think. <laughs> um, I haven't been given this I have. <clears throat> Sorry about this. Why is it not doing that? Slideshow from the beginning. Right. Sorry. Okay. We're there now, finally. Um, so first of all, I need to acknowledge my team because they're the ones who, who really do this um, amazing um, immersion work. Uh, they couldn't join today because actually they're doing something similar in Papua, looking at behaviour around malaria prevention. Um, so I think some of them have just come back to Jakarta, but um, they, that's where they are and they couldn't join. So they've got me, I'm afraid. Um, I've only got 20 minutes. I've put my stopwatch on. Uh, I'd love to talk to you more about this, but um, that's the way it is. And I'll try and get through it as quickly as possible. <clears throat> so let's um, say, you know, first of all, where, are, where in the world are we? We're here, um, Indonesia an extraordinary uh, country, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, we were working with the Better Investment for Stunting Alleviation Program, particularly in their early inception period. Um, and the work that I'm gonna share with you was uh, following on from similar research that um, we did with, uh, with Alive and Thrive in 2019, also in Indonesia. So only a little bit of the study uh, that I'm going to share with you was actually concentrating on adolescents. We were looking at children under two and um, in, in particular and also maternal nutrition. So I'm only looking at a small bit. I just wanted to make that clear from the beginning. So as I said, Indonesia is a diverse country. It's uh, 5,000 kilometres from east to west. It's got 270 million people. Um, they don't even know how many islands they've got. It's disputed, uh, 17,000 roughly, and it's still disputed how many are actually populated uh, with estimates anywhere from 2,500 to 6,000. Um, so uh, we were actually, on this particular study, concentrated in two, two places, which you can see on the map. Here uh, in West Java and over here, uh, on, the, on the eastern side, um, a place which we'll just call NTT, it's Nusa, uh, Tengara Timor, East, East um, Nusa Tengara, and it's much easier to just call it NTT. So I'll be calling it that throughout the, the presentation. <clears throat> so to give you a little flavor of the difference here, some pictures, these seem very strange to me at the moment as I'm looking out of my window and it's snowing, um, but, uh, just to illustrate quickly some of the, the differences between these two areas. So the, the study areas in West Java have diverse income sources. Um, there is agriculture, but increasingly other things, a lot of people work in factories, they work in construction and transportation. Whereas in NTT, it is um, much more a, a typical traditional agriculture and fishing, fishing uh, communities. Um, in West Java, much more urbanized. 
Uh, but you can see by the, the type of housing and so forth and entity a more, more of a rural environment. Of course, these are generalizations, but just to give you a little taste. Uh, another other significant differences between the two is that um, West Java is uh, almost entirely Islamic and uh, Entete is almost entirely Christian. And there are some differences too in uh, the way that people shape their behavior around folklore. And then this word adult, which is actually traditional practices in Entete, many of which are actually very um, supportive of good nutrition, um, in, in particularly amongst uh, women and girls. <clears throat> So before we uh, started our, our formative research, um, we had there was some baseline data available for us from these study sites. Um, and the anemia rates amongst girls 14 to 20 years are very high, an average of 75%. Um, and our particular focus was going to be looking at uh, this issue. Uh, knowledge of anemia was quite a lot better than we probably might have thought, uh, about around about 52%. And consumption of iron, iron source uh, or iron source foods and iron fortified foods was very high, about 90% in West Java and a bit lower in Entete. <clears throat> so, what did we do? Uh, well, we wanted, we realized that there's, and, and as has been illustrated by the previous speaker, that there's not that much studies done uh, on this sort of area. So we, we're very aware that um, we don't know what we don't know. And using qualitative research is a brilliant way of exploring um, this, this conundrum of we don't know what we don't know, whereas surveys constrain us, obviously, to the things that we already think we should be finding out. Um, so it was qualitative um, research and we're using uh, an immersion approach um, simple ethnography, um, but without, uh, I think sometimes we call it a sort of rapid ethnographic approach where we live with families in their own, uh, in their own homes um, and fall in with their everyday life. <clears throat> um, we also uh, followed that by some more structured participatory uh, methods, uh, sort of the more familiar workshops and, and so on, using visualized um, activities, and finally went into a sort of design phase to try and see what we could co-create together. As we all know, and this is why we're here, there's a lot of challenges of research with, with adolescents. So in this picture from, from Indonesia, uh, that little group that I've highlighted there are often um, left out. And they're left out because they're often ill at ease with adults, they're concerned about being judged, um, they like to provide acceptable answers um, as a result, they're quite often very uh, affected by the way that they're treated in school, um, they like to be brief with outsiders, and they often are bored, it's not really very cool to be involved in something that might have been convened at the health center or a meeting that was convened at school um, and they enjoy their own privacy and so as a consequence we often get the same same group of young people at uh, participatory workshops that we might convene in the community and not necessarily reach those uh, that we would like to so with immersion, with living with in their homes, we can create a very uh, informal environment. So uh, as this example of this picture here shows, um, the researcher is this, the, the, the lady in the check, um, chatting with adolescent girls in their own environment and, and sharing a laugh and a giggle. Um, it's that informality and being in their own space makes a, a lot of difference to the way people open up. And what we're doing is combi combining informal conversations, observations, and experience. So if people are telling us about what it's like to, uh, what's available in the market, you don't just listen to that, you actually go with them and experience it for, for yourself. Um, these pictures here in this slide uh, help to illustrate that it, you know, there's no question that it takes time to, uh, to 
unfreeze and build trust. Now, looking at me, I, we've already heard that I've been in this business for 40 years, and you can imagine that might be quite hard for me to sort of connect. But my, the team in Indonesia are all considerably younger than me. Um, but nevertheless, they all recognize that it takes time and that, you know, they've all learned all the team, the research team has learned skills in volleyball and football and dancing and just sitting on sitting and liming, uh, chatting on, on beaches. Um, so this is really important to recognize uh, going in and just doing a focus group doesn't seem to work or it doesn't work for us anyway. Um, when you have the chance of living with families, staying overnight with them for several several days and several nights, there's a, a huge range of things one can understand. So, I mean, just simple things like um, hand washing behavior. We all know that this is a classic survey question and how many times a day. And a lot of people, particularly in Indonesia, know the answer to that. Uh, but when you're there, um, and you're observing and you're talking about it and you're seeing the, the, the difficulties they have to access um, water to, to wash their hands, for example. Uh, we, the main finding that we've, we've got is that they wash their hands after eating, not before, and not before pre preparing food. Um, similarly, um, we've got e examples of um, complementary feeding, for example, people will say, well, I give uh, porridge and I give breast milk. But what we discovered was by living there was that the breastfeeding happens always after the porridge and is regarded not as a food any, uh, anymore, but as a, as a way of quenching thirst. So it's those kind of insights that one can get from, from actually living with people. So I'm just going to just refer to a, 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 cover, a, a bit about the actual eating practices. So um, in both Entete and West Java, there's this strong sense that rice fills you up. Rice is your food. That is what is important. And everything else is just a little bit on the side. They even call them side dishes in Indonesia. Uh, in West Java, uh, where there are the more diverse income opportunities and therefore more disposable um, cash, uh, people rely many, much more on convenience foods, packaged foods. Um, there's little or no animal-based protein eaten here, um, which might sound surprising when you think of that earlier slide looking at, at the, uh, the percentage that... Um, uh, uh, was, was uh, um, eating iron-rich food. Um, also, where there's more disposable income, there's, there's plenty of snack providers, and there's a preference for eating snacks, fried and sweet snacks in particular. Um, and the adolescents get their own pocket money to make their own choices about what they purchase uh, for food. By contrast, in Entete, we found that predominantly it was home cooked food, um, animals based protein uh, was eaten quite a lot, including a lot of things that wouldn't be covered by a survey necessarily bushmeat, squirrel, um, captured birds, uh, snails. These are the sorts of things that often miss, are missed out in surveys. Um, Little disposable income, therefore, uh, very few kiosks selling uh, snacks and the children, were, the adolescents were not um, getting pocket money. So those are kind of some of the insights by living with them. So again, we can see the, the little supermarket in West Java, the snack shop in, uh, that are prevalent there, and then the fresh food market by contrast in Entete. We also gathered some insights into supplements, uh, folic, uh, iron and folic acid supplements. Um, and here that um, we found not just amongst the girls, but amongst um, mothers as well, that, and, and in fact, everybody, that taking tablets is associated with cure. Um, and so if you don't feel bad, you don't need them. Uh, and that's a general thing that we found in, in other studies in Indonesia as well. The, the, the girls were not given an explanation as to why they would given these tablets and there was no connection being made between the tablets and what they could include in their own diets. Um, unfortunately, the supply is irregular or indeed in some places no supply, although it's supposed to be weekly to schools. And this is something that the Visa project itself is actually going to be working on. But 
of course, and this has been exacerbated during the, the COVID period when schools have been shut anyway. So with the opportunity to have informal chats um, at different times of the day, whenever the, the, the uh, girls wanted to interact rather than forcing them to interact in a, in a workshop situation, um, we found that um, most of them had uh, intentions and, and were in fact completing junior high school, that they wanted to work before they had children, that they wanted to delay having children until they were at least 22, um, and they did not define themselves as future mothers. And I think that was kind of important insight because a lot of the um, uh, education programs around nutrition um, sort of focus on that aspect. And that was a kind of, no, <laughs> please not. Uh, we don't know if want to think about that yet, um, reaction. Um, so as we moved into the more structured research, you can see here now sort of a more typical kind of workshopping process. Um, uh, we, we looked um, in more detail at their, some of their aspirations and how they felt about themselves. And they, you can see in these pictures, they're doing some body mapping drawings and talking about what they like and what they don't like. And much of this was, was framed in terms of boys and love. And so the, the girls in, in West Java on the left-hand side, they were talking about how it was important for them to have light skin and long sleek hair. Whereas the girls in, in, in Te Te was telling us that they hate our curly hair and they don't like their dark skin. Uh, on West Java, we, they like to stay inside. Sometimes they have more restrictions about their movement um, anyway from their parents, but they also don't like to get sweaty. And some other studies that we've done around physical activity um, has shown this as well. And in uh, Entete, their fitness and their sort of um, uh, attractiveness to boys often was associated with being outside and active and uh, fit and climbing trees and dancing a lot. <clears throat> um, similarly, we asked them about uh, the sorts of information that they found was useful for them and that they trusted. And the next slide will show um, a table that we've we put together based, and you can see how we interacted with other groups as well, but we'll just look particularly at this table. So this is, these are the kinds of preferences from, from where they like to get information. <clears throat> and the school class gets a, a red, so it's a traffic light system here that we use. So red means they don't like information from school. So of course we, you know, this is op opportunities to explore this, understand this more when we've got time to talk with them. And this is a typical situation um, classroom situation from Indonesia, uh, one way um, kind of uh, lecture style. And the girls were telling us that they like, they prefer information to be given in a fun way and not a serious way, like in school. It was boring, the, what they did get, uh, there was no chance to ask questions. Um, can't read the other one. <laughs> um, and and, and so forth. So these were all kind of reasons why uh, they didn't think that the school was effective or useful. Oh, the, but the, the, the teachers being judgmental. Um, okay, so we then look at social media and I noticed, you know, there was um, in the previous talk about uh, this being quite a, a sort of an interesting way for connecting with, with youngsters. But again, this doesn't score all that well. And we wanted to understand that better. So this picture shows girls um, gathering together and, and looking at TikTok together, but they clearly said that social media is for recreation purposes only. They don't like it when it gets infiltrated by um, information and government messages and so forth. Um, it's a teen thing, get off adults <laughs> don't interfere with this thing and it puts them puts them off um there's also particularly i suppose it's everywhere but it's it's um, a particular problem in indonesia with quite a lot of fake news and a fake information and people find this very very confusing so they don't trust it anyway so 
uh, the kinds of things that, uh, just to give you some more examples of the sorts of um, things that they would be saying. So when they have a formal socialization, that's a kind of a big event where a particular um, a topic is discussed. Um, it's, they felt too shy to ask questions. When they get the tablets, there's a sort of typical question, will I get those tablets after I leave school? kind of insights on behavior. I put the tablet under my tongue anyway and spit it out because it doesn't taste very nice. And um, I don't remember when the last time I got them. Um, <clears throat> uh, teachers, uh, let's go home and hardly remember anything anyway. It was too crowded and quick and noisy. So that's the sort of conversations that we had. So we wanted then to look at this area, which they did think was something useful. And it's very encouraging to see that uh, quite a lot of, of the studies from the previous um, speaker are in fact um, talking about uh, games and participatory activities. So we wanted to find out, well, what could we do here with them? So we have had some experience in using human-centered design and uh, this diagram on the, that I've just put up shows that sort of um, general feeling. So the discovery, the exploratory stage um, and moving around to coming up with ideas, ideating, ideation is sort of coming up with as many different interesting ideas as possible and then trying them, failing fast and trying others. And that's the sort of principles behind human-centered design so that it's, it's, it's having empathy for the, the, end, the end user. However, with time um, using this approach, we've changed its name to people-driven design because we find it that it is much more helpful to have the, um, the, the target group, whatever you want to call them, participants, the teenagers in the driving seat um, and, do, and, and rather than just being cognizant or just being aware of them and empathizing with them from outside, that actually when they take over, we get better, more interesting, uh, more relevant and relatable results. So um, together with Alive and Thrive too, we've coined this, this new, phrase, new term, people-driven design. So our design challenge was um, recognizing uh, the importance of iron, understanding the function of iron, uh, encouraging iron-rich diets, uh, recognize the benefits, reducing the dependency on the supplementation, um, particularly where there are supply side limitations and how to accept the supplementation more readily. So those are kind of part of our design challenge. And those of you who know about human-centered design will know that it's, it's always then phrased as a how might we statement, which allows for this um, generation of lots of different ideas. So how might we address iron deficiency sustainably? Now, what I want to emphasize at this point is that we, now, now I'm talking about the Visa Project um, and Empatica and other, others involved, um, started to, we, we um, immersed ourselves in the immersion data and evidence and tried to come up with some possible ideas, but these were only for inspiration. These were not the ideas to test. So they were just some ideas to get, to, to really think about what are the key behaviors we wanted to check, to influence and the ways they might possibly be done. And we came up with this idea that we might want to um, encourage them to, to develop um, their own games and making sure it was locally relevant and relatable. So going back now to the to the villages, um, and this now was really in Entete where we did this, um, we wanted to promote a positive weekend attitude amongst the girls. And we did this by, once again, dancing with them, having fun with them, recognizing and reiterating that they are the expert um, in their environment uh, they know the, the foods, the weather, the, you know, how to party, et cetera, et cetera. And that we were genuinely interested in them and their opinions, their aspirations, and of course, their love lives, because that was quite important to them. 
So we started on a journey where they manage their own research. And in this um, diagram, you can see that uh, they, they, they use their smartphones and access some data about iron content of locally available foods. And they made up dishes um, with these post-its to show how they could meet their recommended um, daily dosages and, uh, and played around. And this, this happened over several days, um, working through all sorts of ideas that they had. Finally, um, they, they came up with an idea that they wanted to play some uh, games and this would be a good way of teaching others about iron. And they came up with two main ones, um, the one which came to be known as the Iron Snakes and Ladders and a poker game, both of which were popular in the community. And we're going to just look at the Snakes and Ladders one because the other one didn't work in the end, which also shows that you, you, know, you want to fail because that's important too. Um, and they created stories around their understanding of, of, of how they can increase and decrease their iron intake and so forth. And so a lot of these stories, they, they wrote up uh, little, little um, anecdotes and so on um, that they enjoyed writing. Uh, some of them need to be fact-checked, obviously, <laughs> they're not all, you know, all of them ended up in the, in the game. <clears throat> so just to give you a little, little idea of some of those, so uh, some of those things said this morning I had breakfast with my dad, I had kelol, which is a dark green leafy um, vegetable, I mixed it with carrot, and so as a result my iron was um, topped up, so in the game they could step forward um, 10 steps. Uh, went to a party all, and danced all night, even though I ate um, pork and cow and greens. I was sweating so much, I lost um, some, some uh, but I was still good because I was eating meat and so on. So that was the idea of, of um, topping up there. Um, I ate rice and squirrel, and so I also topped up. So these are just little examples of some of the cards that they created for their game. Uh, and then here, 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 I drank iced tea after lunch and my iron absorption was affected, um, as you know. And uh, this is a bit of a fun one. Um, it's debatable whether tears actually have iron, well, they do have iron in them, that's, that's not debatable, but how much you actually lost. But you see that it's only a step back one, but it was fun, it was relatable, and it made them think and talk and talk about the fact that they need to take care of their, um, of their nutrition to keep this iron, iron levels high and, and balanced. So here you see a picture of them uh, playing it. They, they made it into a competitive game with teams against each other. These are the, um, the squares that they could move. They could take the steps forward or backwards. Uh, and these girls here are reading out the, the questions. So um, these are learning from... Sorry yes. to interrupt, Dee. Um, if you could just wrap up soon so there's some time for questions. Yes, been oh, sorry. I've got, I've, I've, yeah, sorry to I interrupt. Just, it took me 20 minutes. I don't know why it's taking <laughs> It always takes much. longer on the day. <laughs> Anyway, so, think, worry. anyway, so they designed it um, themselves. They're very proud of it. It's fun. Uh, they could play it in a big group. It's relatable. And um, afterwards, they had a little quiz, and the and boys and girls could answer it. And it also um, generated a lot of discussion when they were they were walking home. They wanted to try it out with others, which they did. Um, and they adapted the questions, and they adapted the the little stories. So that gives you that clue. And then, um, uh, so when we did some follow up with them and they did their own re research and follow up, we found that indeed things were changing. Households and families were thinking much more about what they were eating, thinking about their teenagers um, uh, uh, food intake, encouraging them to eat iron rich foods. And it also generated some interest with the village governments who looked at this and saw this as something that was quite different from the way things were done normally. Always we ask about scale out. And I think a key question here is that this was not about designing a game that could be manufactured and provided in a box throughout Indonesia. That's, that would defeat the point. The point was that we can, we can now, to scale out, we can promote the principles of this. So we can provide guidelines to undertake um, a similar process, one which is contextualized and relatable. So Emily, for the last slide. <laughs> so
So the key lessons from this is that um, really it's a question of, with the immersion research of really understanding that context, the difference between what people say, particularly what they say or recall in surveys and what they're actually doing. Um, uh, and then basing the interventions, basing the support on things that actually matter. And, you know, having boyfriends matters, um, having sleek, dark hair uh, matters. So using those as ways to encourage uh, behavior change. Um, recognizing, as I've said, that this is a process, not a product. Um, seeing ownership, ownership of the process is really important and that we were providing guidance and inspiration only and when we, when when a, a particular um, health uh, service provider said, "Oh, we can now do the same game everywhere," they weren't interested anymore. It had to be something that they had developed themselves, um, and the whole process builds confidence to to make those changes themselves. Learning from uh, iteration. There we go. And so, thank you to all the inspirational teen girls who were involved in this process and thank you all for for listening to me and I apologize again for going over time okay no don't worry thank you so much I wish we could uh, let you chat on for a bit longer because it's so interesting um and there have been quite a lot of questions posted in the chat box we will try and come to a couple now we we only have about uh, seven minutes uh, to ask some questions um so perhaps the uh in the next session or over the break and in the next session you could have a scan through the chat box and answer some of those questions as well um so we have got a few minutes and there have been uh, there were quite a few questions that came um as people registered but there's also some questions that have come in the chat box so we're going to try and answer a couple of them if um tash and stephanie could put your video and um and uh, unmute yourself that would be great uh because the first question is I'm going to um, uh, ask to you both is that uh, when you were talking about the, the difference in uh, measurements, the difference in the uh, from the DHS data, the reanalysis, um, one question came in the chat box was, it, so the message that you're trying to get across, is it that it's good to use the WHO cutoffs because it gives a more refined picture? So I don't know which one of you will answer that, but one of you could please. Um, I, I can answer that. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily say we're, we're recommending the WHO reference over another reference. What we're asking for is standardization um, across the community so that we all just use the same reference. I think the CDC reference only has American children in it, so it's potentially not useful globally. But the IOTF reference and the WHO reference uh, are both uh, international references and they actually paint quite a similar picture if um, you choose the same uh, Z score cutoff. So I think we just want um, standardization. I, I have no preference of one over the other, although the WHO, I suppose, is um, does fit in with what we use for children under five. So perhaps that one is easier. Great, thank you. Uh, another question for that presentation. Um, in terms of the mapping study that was done, um, how were policies um, identified um, that are in use for adolescents across countries? How did how did you come across the policies? Tash or Steph? I think Tash is frozen for a moment. Stephanie, can you answer that? Yeah, I think probably Tash would have been the better person to answer that because I, I wasn't actually involved in kind of forming how the policies, um, that kind of those questions. But I think um, from what I understand, um, those we it was very open ended when our engagement with the um, stakeholders who responded to the survey. And um, they came from a range of sectors um, working in a range of different countries. So um, they, it was just very open-ended on kind of what they knew from policies, from working in their settings. Um, and 
that contributed into our results for the report. So it all was very driven by stakeholders who are working in the respective countries in adolescent nutrition. Yes, thanks, Steph. Uh, that was a, a good effort <laughs> to answer. Great. Uh, there was a couple of questions for you, Dee. Um, one that has sort of a, a few parts to it. Uh, how long was the immersion phase and, and what was the duration of the study and how many families were involved in the study? There are some questions. Um, okay. Uh, we always stay um, a minimum of four nights. Um, that's oh, a sort of yes, that's right. yeah. That's that's, Sorry, that's a can hear you can now. I can okay. A minimum of four nights is it's a compromise because we'd like to stay longer, and I think anthropologists and ethnographers would like us to stay longer too. But there is a, a limit to both resources that you have, and also more to the um, tolerance. I think of the of the families that you're living with. Um, but four at the same time gives you the chance to really build up rapport and to not be treated as a guest. So that's quite important. Um, the number of households again we'd always like to stay with more than often the that we can in the studies um i, th I can't even remember <laughs> but I, I think what one has to remember with this is that they're usually in the numbers of about between about 20 and 30 households altogether uh, not not into the same village in different houses in different villages usually about four in each village but um we're interacting with far more than just the household. So although you're staying overnight and you have these close experiences and observations within your sort of the house that you're staying in, you're also having very close interactions with neighbors and, and the community in general and interacting with people that they meet, whether it's people in the market or it's the health service providers or it's the teachers and so on. So um, in this study, it, it went over several months, but that was because we, we wanted to do it in stages. So we had the immersion and then we came back and, and looked at the information from the immersion. Then we went back to do some structured research, which was based on, on looking at particular things that we wanted to explore further. And then we came back and then we went out a third time uh, to help with the design. And then because COVID hit, we were then supporting them remotely um, from then on. So we had quite a few weeks. Uh, I think the whole design and the design trials were done over uh, a period of two months where we were um, supporting them remotely by telephone um, every, uh, every week. Um, so yeah, um, I mean, they've, these, these studies vary and sadly we're always constrained by <laughs> resources. <clears throat> Thank you, Dee. Thank you. That's very interesting. So we have run out of time to do more question and answers. We are doing our best to answer them in the chat box. So do keep posting them there. If, as a reminder, please post it to the panelists and attendees and then everybody can see your question and, and the answer. Um, but we will also uh, do our best to answer them after the meeting as well. Either we will uh, respond in the meeting report by just posting some information or whatever, or we will uh, try and post some questions and answers on and get people to answer on Ennet. Um, so we're going to have a short break now for 15 minutes. Do please stay with us because um, we're very excited about the youth panel that is coming up. Um, so please do stay with us. So thank you once again for the, to the presenters for very interesting presentations and we will see you shortly. Absolutely delighted uh, to be able to welcome Sophie Healy Tao, uh, who is going to moderate our youth panel this afternoon. Um, I'm lucky enough to have met Sophie about, must be about four years ago now, and was instantly impressed and uh, continue to be as I see her um, develop and, um, and uh, yeah, be more and more on the international stage. So a quick bio, um, Sophie's a youth activist who likes to promote food security and gender equality. Uh, she's impressively a lead group member. She's the youth representative and lead group member on the, of the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, the Sun Movement. But she also serves on the board of ActionAid UK, which is a UK uh, leading international charity. She's also a co-founder of AgriCure, an, an online platform which aims to promote women and decrease the gender gap in agriculture in developing countries. 
and this is with eight young people across the Grove. She's a regular speaker and panelist at international conferences and events. As I said, when I tend to see Sophie, she's often on the stage with President this or Vice President that. So she's very used to, uh, to um, hanging out with lots of very important people. Uh, Sophie is one of the 10 women leaders who was featured in the Disney book Choose to Matter by ESP, ESPN presenter Julie Foudy and that encourages young women to find the leader within and in 2014 and must have been very young then she was named by Time magazine as one of the most influential teens. Um, Sophie is just in her final year of studies of international development and food policy at University College Cork. So I will hand over to Sophie now, who is going to moderate our panel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it was a very long time ago now. It feels like a lifetime ago. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today, um, especially when you've heard a lot about adolescent nutrition and young people um, to take part and hear from young people working in nutrition in this area. Um, also, thank you for e to ENN for giving us this platform to host this. Um, very seldom that we get allowed to moderate our own discussions um, and actually have an open conversation with young people across the globe. Uh, today, you'll be hearing from um, right across the globe. We've got Bangladesh, we've got the UK, we've got Zimbabwe. So we're really going to get a diverse range of um, experiences from young people working in the field. And um, so I'm Sophie. Um, I've been working on food security and nutrition activism for a really long time now, <laughs> it feels like forever. And um, I got interested through science um, I didn't really learn about nutrition or food security or even the importance of food in school. Um, I started doing DIY science projects, so do-it-yourself science projects and entering them into science competitions as the big nerd I am. And I ended up being very good at them and all my projects were around food and the science of food and how important food was and agriculture and food production. And I ended up down a little bit of a rabbit hole of being the um, youth representative ticked off the box at conferences and events that were mainly run by um, pale, stale and male <laughs> um, people. And it wasn't a very fun place for me to be in. And that's when um, I took myself out of that and started working with young people um, in Ireland and Europe and across the globe on lobbying to get young people represented at tables that mattered and where our voices and opinions mattered, specifically in the area of nutrition and food security. Especially as 42% of the world's population are young people and we're increasingly being aware and taking to the streets to support and um, climate action and climate change. But you see often that the issues are siloed. Um, I believe that climate action activists are climate action activists, and then the not so popular and the not so trendy uh, food activists are food activists, and then the gender activists are gender activists. So I think we're coming into an age now where we see that these are being cross-sectored and we're working a lot better together, which is very exciting. Um, but what we're also seeing is progress, but that progress is really patchy and really slow. And that's what young people lobby for, faster paced change. And also we need better um, budgets and budget allocations for nutrition if 3 million young people die a year because of malnutrition that means that being healthy is a luxury at the moment and that's something we just can't afford when the sustainable development goals are over in 2030 um, so we really do need to see a change and I think you'll hear from our young people today that that change is happening and they're working really really hard at it um, 
So I am going to introduce our first incredible speaker, um, a person I get to call my friend, um, Dipti. Dipti is 17 years old. She's from Bangladesh. She is working with adolescents, but also for adolescents in her country through SKNF, which is an adolescent network. And she's been working with them from a very young age. She's working to ensure adolescent nutrition, also to prevent child marriage and ensuring reproductive health um, and adolescent rights. She's also successfully worked with GAIN in their project of a food pledge in Bangladesh, which was highly successful by the way, and she really does run a great project throughout the years on that. Um, she wants nutritious food instead of only food as a basic right. And she is ready to work hard to ensure that that is a necessity. She believes that the young generation have the power to change now more than ever. And I have the great privilege of actually working with Dipti on making this Bangladeshi pledge a global pledge um, in the coming year. And she's gonna speak a little bit about that. So I'm gonna hand the baton over to Dipti to talk about why young people are so important and the work she's doing. Uh, oh my God, Sophie, what a great interjection. Thank you so much. And I'm very happy to call you as my friend. And hello to everyone who are listening to me today. And Sophie has um, introduced me to uh, all of you. And now I uh, always, what I say that why adolescents, why young people are so much uh, important. Uh, you know, uh, you all are thinking, you all are uh, talking and researching about the adolescents, but uh, in many countries, the many adolescents don't know that they are more important than any other ages. Uh, in Bangladesh, as um, Bangladesh is a developing country, I have faced it uh, very closely. And there are 40 million adolescents in Bangladesh, and I am one of them, and I am working with all of them. Um, uh, what I have faced and realized that our adolescents and young people don't know um, their importance, uh, their rights, and their, their rules in the society. And why adolescents or young people are important? Um, I think it's easy to say why not they are important because it's a new decade um, and in the uh, it's, it's the beginning and in the uh, end of the decade, they will maybe the uh, change maker or policy maker of the whole world. And if we don't um, give impasses on the, them, uh, in every sectors, they will not be uh, properly ready actually. If we want to have a generation which is um, aware about nutrition, which is educated must, we have to add, uh, we have to emphasize on the adolescents or the young. So uh, the past generation of Dr. D. Job or uh, Emily, uh, all of the, those are the previous generation of us. Uh, but we don't have anything to make them uh, better or a better version, but we have the possibility to make the adolescents or the young uh, as a golden person, as a, a very precious person. So um, in view to, uh, with a view to uh, making a generation which will be um, properly ready to lead the world, we have to and have to emphasize on young people's nutrition, uh, their uh, education, and all their needs. That's, I think. Great. Thank you so much, Ditti. I think you've covered a lot of really important topics. Um, and I think we have a few questions for you at the end. So thank you so much. And now I'm going to introduce Webster, another um, activist who I've met quite a few times and we've collaborated on um, issues for newspapers and articles and he's a brilliant writer. So you should really 
read his stuff. If Webster has a um, link, you can put it in the chat box. But Webster is a scaling up nutrition youth leader for nutrition uh, from Zimbabwe. He's studying law at the University of Zimbabwe, and he started activating, advocating for nutrition and zero hunger after successfully attending a Zimbabwe Scaling Up Nutrition Alliance workshop meant to engage young parliamentarians to talk about nutrition to their seniors and fellow youth when he was only 17 and finishing high school. Now he volunteers and works closely with the Zimbabwean Scaling Up Nutrition Alliance and his member and its member organizations in advocating for nutrition financing and prioritization. He has also trained other 50 plus fellow youths to be nutrition advocates and under the guidance of the Zimbabwe Scaling Up Nutrition Alliance has actually set up nutrition clubs that host a range of activities from cooking demonstrations to establishing school orchards. So I say Webster for president really. Um, Webster, over to you. Um, thank you, Sophie, uh, for the introduction and hello, everybody. My name is Webster Makombe and I'm a youth leader for nutrition from, from Zimbabwe. And I think adolescent nutrition is very important. And the reason why I said uh, advocating for, for, nut for nutrition, especially adolescent nutrition, is because when I was 17, that's when I started knowing much about nutrition. So I was then thinking like from the time 16 going backwards, I didn't know much about nutrition. So I took it upon myself that no one has to learn about nutrition that much later in their lives. So that's why I'm working with um, school going kids so that they get to know about nutrition and uh, everything else about nutrition at a very at a very early age. And looking at adolescent nutrition um, as, a, as a topic, uh, I think it, it, it mainly focuses on the youth and with the understanding that being a young person or being a youth is just a phase. It's not like a, a constant position where you are. You just have to pass through it. And it's a moment that is so precious as you have to make the most of it. So I'm gonna give you like an example of why adolescent nutrition is very important because the boys and the girls that we have today are going to be the mothers and fathers tomorrow. All right. So most of the efforts that are around the world right now are mainly I may be mainly focusing on making sure that the children who are zero to five are well nourished and are not obese or, or undernourished, um, things like that. But then come to think of it, what if we target young boys and girls so that instead of um, trying to, to, to cure the babies from, from malnutrition and, and obesity, what if we then uh, train a group of young people or have a culture of young people who grow up to be healthy parents. Because if they grow up to be healthy parents, they will then have healthier babies. So that's uh, basically my belief. And that's why I'm really um, keen on working with young people because I understand like myself, I'm, I'm, I'm a future father. So I'm trying to make sure that I'm a healthy future father so that I have a healthier um, uh, future baby. And also the other thing that when people are looking at adolescent nutrition and the youth in particular, <clears throat> In, uh, in particular, they look at it from a, um, as if the young people are homogeneous group. They do not uh, understand that young people are, are different. They may, when they say young people, or they use, they say, they speak as if they're talking about a particular person or a particular group of people. But we have to understand these are people with different religious beliefs. These are people from different ge uh, geographical backgrounds. These are people from different social backgrounds. Uh, these are people like, with, uh, with, with various differences. And that is something that has to be looked at when you're talking about Atlas. And I'm very happy that as the, pa uh, the panel that we have today, you can actually see diversity in it. So I think that's also one of the things that we really have to look at um, when you're talking about adolescent uh, nutrition. I'm gonna give a, a few examples. Like for instance, you might take that, um, say in my culture, like in a sub-Saharan uh, Shona culture, they say a child cannot eat eggs, you know, if they're still eating because they'll grow up to be to be a thief, but then that's like depriving someone of, of a healthy, of a very healthy, nutritious um, diet. So that, those are also the things that we really need to look at when you're looking at the issue of, uh, of adolescent nutrition and how best we can tackle um, the issue of adolescent nutrition and make sure that everyone has a balanced diet and grow to their fullest uh, 
potential, taking into, into cognizance the geographical, religious, and, uh, and the gender, gender differences. Because as, as most people say, they say the adolescent phrase is the second window of opportunity, op of opportunity because you know, the first window of opportunity is the first, first 1,000 days. So maybe if you miss it during the first 1,000 days, then you can later catch it up um, as, a, as an adolescent. But then if you miss it then, uh, I assure you, you'd have uh, missed it uh, for life. Yeah, so that's basically what I, I understand and what I strive for when I, when I think of adolescent nutrition, especially with the understanding that this is just a phase. Pretty soon I'm gonna be a very uh, tired, pale, stale adult. <laughs> but it's just, I think it's gonna, just gonna take 10 years or so. So I'm, I think I, we have to make the most of the time that we have now, because it's just a, a, a phase we're in transit, all this energy is gonna be, it's gonna go away pretty soon. So we have to make the most of the time we have, Sophie, and everyone was listening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Webster. I think you hit on a really important um, topic that maybe we can discuss later about how we're all lumped in to the same group of young people um, when really different regions, different uh, cultural backgrounds um, really has a part to play, especially when you think of food as a um, as a political power in certain countries. So it's really interesting to hear your perspective. And now I'm going to introduce you all to the amazing Tasha, who I met on World Food Day. And she is really incredible because um, you bring a UK perspective, but you also discuss food in a way that it is like politics and economics, and it's a really interesting perspective also. So Tasha is a former co-chair and serving trustee, amazing, of Bite Back 2030, which is a youth-led organization that exists to reveal the truth about how the food system is designed and how it can be redesigned to put young people's health at the forefront of its operations. For Tasha, reforming the food system means improving the flow of affordable, healthy options and stemming the tide, stemming the tide of junk foods pouring out from high streets, supermarket shelves and school canteens. Her activism began in 2015 when she encouraged her school to sign up to the Sugar Smart Pledge, a call on local communities to commit to reducing the availability and promotion of sugar products. Since then, Tasha has been keen to finish what she started and give every child the opportunity to thrive and be healthy no matter where they live. And I, I really love that because I've noticed that on my university campus last year, we had to actually introduce a food bank for students because we just couldn't afford food and the food that we could afford was not healthy food. So I'm really interested to hear your perspective on this. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sophie, for that lovely introduction. Um, I did have a video lined up um, at the beginning. Is that something that you share on your side? My apologies. I think ENN will share that. Just doing it now. Oh, my God. There's nothing you can really do about it because you don't even realise it's happening. Scary. Do you want to just leave that envelope there, by the way? Here's your menu. Give you a couple of minutes, all right? Do you for a calamari with? What are you thinking? Triple dip chicken. Triple dip. Triple, triple dip. Triple dip chicken, please. This envelope was given to you before you made your choice, right? Yeah. Are you being for real? Oh, my God. That's just crazy. There was other things that I wanted on this menu. That's so weird. How did you do that?
I've seen that. Dr. Alex, the guy from Leviathan. Yesterday, I saw this on my feed. I was thinking he's a doctor, but he's eating greasy food. It's Anton. I saw that when I looked on his thing as well. Big smile afterwards, yeah. like, mm, that was delicious. Oh, wow. Just scrolled right past, didn't even like it, but that is so weird. Hello. Triple dip chicken, you can't resist. Oh, wow. I didn't even notice that. That's crazy. <laughs> I didn't notice that on the seats, actually, I'm not going to lie to you. I remember, like, the colours more so the actual thing on it. Oh, yeah. I didn't even notice. That was on the wall as well. I can't remember it. I don't remember that. Really, it's, like, subconsciously. You're playing the tricks of your mind. I suppose it already does influence you then, doesn't it? I think this method of marketing in the food industry is wrong. Scary. Just, like, pushing us towards things that aren't maybe best for us. The fact that I didn't notice anything, but I had it in my head, it's just scary. There's nothing you can really do about it, because you don't even realise it's happening. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much um, to Sophie and ENN for inviting me to kind of share my perspective on adolescent, adolescence and nutrition. I'm really excited to be here and engage in some of the conversation that we'll have after this little presentation. So my name is Tasha. Um, I am a food lover and a food advocate. Um, so I, like Sophie mentioned, I recently became a trustee at Bite Back 2030. And this was after I was invited to join the board at the end of my term as a youth board co-chair. Uh, so the video that you guys have just watched was used to launch Bite Back um, a little over a year ago and raise awareness of our, of our mission to reduce childhood obesity. So when we launched, we knew that young people, especially teenagers, um, they are notoriously hard to reach audience. And we didn't, we didn't want to respond, and we don't respond well in general to a preachy message about healthy eating. So we wanted something that was um, that would give young people as much autonomy as possible to help them really understand what is outside of their control and encourage them to feel this outrage that I felt when I realized some of the sneaky tactics that the food industry uses against young people to essentially manipulate our choices. Um, so like the video mentioned, we used the same techniques as the advertising industry, um, but we wanted to make sure we do it in a way that really ultimately reveals the impact of these tactics. And the point of the film was to was a call for action. Um, it wasn't scripted or staged, but authentically created to really highlight just how powerful the food industry is when it comes to um, young people. And so this leads nicely into what I do and who Bite Back is. So Bite Back 2030 is here for young people. Um, we believe that young people, we want young people to know the truth about how the food system works. And so that's what the video does. A lot of people don't know what's going on behind the scenes when you're watching an, an, an advert. A lot of the time, we're not very much aware of the messages that we're consuming when it comes to um, food, uh, junk food advertising. And so that video does a perfect job of kind of highlighting this um, revelation that you you experience when you found out exactly what is going on but also we really are emphasizing this idea on looking at how can we redesign it to make sure that we put young people's health at the forefront of its operations and we hope to do that by building a powerful alliance with businesses companies governments parents teachers um, and other young people and really just anybody else who can help to make that redesign a reality help us tackle this um, global obesity epidemic that we currently have. Um, and we know that in the UK, it has one of the worst obesity rates in Western Europe. Um, over 3.3 million children are overweight. And so we're calling for the food industry to really start taking um, health as a priority. And so when we look at some of the factors that influence um, childhood obesity, we're not just looking at the prevalence of advertising for foods that are high in fat, salt and sugar, um, but we're also looking at our, and this is what our recent um, campaign is looking at, um, we're calling for 
an end to our relentless exposure to online junk food advertising. We know that young people are exposed to 15 billion online adverts for junk food every single year. And this has a huge influence in terms of like what we decide to then consume, whether that's us at home, which is the majority of us with the current um, COVID pandemic. But even when we are out and we, you know, socializing with friends and families, a lot of what we decide to eat has already pre has been pre-decided for us um, already. And so for me, why we need young people involved in any food system and nutrition transformation is because number one, young people, we are at the forefront of of life, of everything, of every system. So when we look at um, the, some of the issues that are happening in the world, so the obesity epidemic, climate change, um, and all these things, young people are the ones that are likely to be most affected. And so for the first time in history, young people, um, it's predicted that it's the first time that young people will no longer have the same ex age expectancy as their parents. And I find that really absurd. For over uh, the last like two decades, it's been, you know, you're likely to live Longer than your parents and perhaps there is evidence to suggest, to suggest that this is um, reverting and is turning backwards but also other evidence suggests that okay perhaps younger people will grow older than their parents but it's likely that in their last you know twilight years they're going to suffer from poor health um, and I also think that on top of that young people bring a unique experience when it comes to how we experience the food system. And I like how Web, um, Webstar put it in that a lot of the time when we talk about young people, we're just you know, put into this cluster, into this one group. And I think we forget that young people, the way that we experience our environment is unique to our age group. Um, I can assure you that the majority of adults here, uh, pre-COVID at least, did not hang out in their local chicken and chip shop as a way to socialize with their friends and families. Like that doesn't exist. But for young people after school, if you want to meet up with your friends and, you know, you want to get, you know, play some games, socialize, you meet at your local fast food shop. And that is a new perspective that we can bring whenever we're looking at um, any social policies that are looking to tackle um, adolescent nutrition. And I think things like this, where we have platforms where young people are able to um, express and share their unique experiences and the way that they engage and interact with the food system, it brings we it then brings a more holistic approach when we are tackling childhood obesity or any other um, social issue because a, a lot of the time and this is one of the things that really just annoys me and gets to me is we're having adults talking about young people and there's not a single young person at the table there is not a single young person being asked what do you think or how what do you think about this how have you experienced this and I'm just thinking what is going on and so for me it's about having young people really engaged in the conversation and not just like a tick box exercise you know where you just include them for the sake of including them but really including them and listening to exactly what they have to say and what input they can bring into into that approach and so overall that allows us you know when we're talking about um, the food environment and allowing foods to be more ex healthier foods to be more accessible more affordable and more available that can only be accomplished through a more collaborative approach with effective partnerships and coordinated action and not just on a, a national level, but also on a local level and across public, um, the public sector, the private sector and voluntary sector as well. I think I've rambled on a little bit too much now. So I'm really excited for the conversation that we're about to have. Thank you again so much to in and e and n for inviting me over this afternoon. We could listen to you forever, Tasha. That was brilliant. And actually what you talked about collaboration brings you brings us really well into a question we got from the audience um, and that was if we had to choose what platforms or channels for receiving nutritional education um, recommendations around diet and physical activity during the post-pandemic times what channel or platforms would we prefer and I'm actually going to flip that question on its head I'm going to ask Ian N to put up our first poll of our session and that is how do you engage with uh, policymakers on improving nutrition and healthy diets oh no 
sorry, that's a different question completely. What do you as participants believe are the best ways to interact with younger people? Is it, I feel like, um, who wants to be a millionaire? Is it A, uh, social media, B, workshops? Um, and then our second question is, what format do you think they prefer? Online conferences or in-person conferences? Our third question is, um, or reach them via emails or in-person meetings. Now, this is a fun one and you have a few seconds to answer um, because we also asked um, some young people these questions. And um, so we will compare your answers and see how well, how well you know us. Okay. Know how long I should leave this on for? It's the numbers keep going up. Okay. Brill. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Should we share the results? I can't see them. Oh yeah. Okay. So, eight sixty-eight percent of you said social media for the first question. Um. 63% of you said in-person conferences for the second and 77% said in-person meetings for the third. So I'm going to share my screen and show you the results of this poll for um, young people I asked earlier. Let's see if I can show that. Now this is very rudimental research, I have to admit. Can you see the... Okay, so we said, we asked people, what formats do you like to interact with? They said social media for the first one. So you guys got that correct. For the second question, online conferences are in person. Um, in person, so 60%, you, got, got, you guys got that correct as well. You're doing well so far. And then in-person meetings as well. So you guys know us. <laughs> Um, brilliant. So that was just a fun way of getting the ball rolling, getting our discussion started. Um, and now we have some questions to just have a little discussion between Tasha, Webster, Dipti, and if you guys can jump in whenever you want input or have an answer, please do. So my first question is, how has COVID impacted your work or change the importance of what you're trying to do? So I'm happy to answer. Um, so for me, it hasn't really changed the way in which we work. Um, because we are, you know, a youth led organization, we tend to reach out to other young people through social media. And so throughout um, the, the lockdowns that we've had, we've just been able to amplify um, our usage of um, social media in that way. Um, but for me, it's also about, um, so when we look at the most successful campaign that we've had um, at Bike Bag, that's been around uh, free school meals. And we were calling on the government to extend free school meals over the holidays as a result of the COVID lockdowns. Um, Christina, who is the co-chair at the moment, her petition um, calling on Boris Johnson to take action got signed by over um, 400,000 uh, times and it caught the attention of footballer Marcus Rashford and that also generated a new wave of, of attention and compassion towards the issue. And so we were able to do that by social media. It's so easy, you know, for us to really underestimate how we can really utilise social media, it would be quite um, silly to be honest. Like social media, you're able to distribute information so fast and it's so easy and young people spend ridiculous and I'm one of them I confess ridiculous amounts of hours on social media and so if you're so if you're really looking to engage with them get their opinion their perspective on things the only way to see that really effectively is using social media platforms hello yeah, I think um, for me, um, the experience has uh, changed uh, totally. Because I said earlier on, I usually work with in-school young people. So now that the schools have been closed, I haven't been able to, you know, 
to get them all together and also that um the most of the nutrition clubs are in schools as well so um that is also another problem and most of these kids are from um rural communities and um peri urban communities so they do not have like um you know um gadgets and for those who do still um social media um and even data expenses um are very are, are quite high as sophie can testify even i myself i sometimes miss um meetings zoom meetings and panels because of um internet connection difficulties. So to say that I can be able then to sum up, um, say a social media group or to do something uh, on social media, it's a, it's a very far stretch. But the least I could do was set up a WhatsApp group. So now on those WhatsApp group, I can then able, um, uh, we call it the Nutrition Advocates Zimbabwe. It's a very uh, um, jovial group of young people. So we have two, I think we have three nutritionists who are on, on, in that group as well. So every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, they do they take turns and deliver uh, nutrition messages in, the, in that group as well. Yeah, so in, in, even though I cannot then meet with my young um, friends anymore in the schools, I can still get to reach them through uh, WhatsApp. And I think um, some of them could manage even watching on this panel right now. So those are some of the things that we are able to, but then um, COVID-19 has definitely um, affected the way I conduct my, my, my work. But I also, on the other side, I think it's a good thing because it then, uh, uh, then gives me room to try and look for other alternatives and see how best I can become like Tasha and make the most of social media. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, the situation of mine is quite similar to Esther because uh, uh, the schools are closed and I was used to work with the uh, school going adolescents uh, through uh, adolescents club actually. And we have 5,000 clubs, adolescent clubs in different secondary schools. And they used to have a meeting a weekly and there they got the information of nutrition, the way they have to eat foods and uh, about their rights or all these things. And uh, after that, they uh, were used to uh, spread that one for, uh, to their, all the students of their class. So uh, being the school closed, that is really very much hampered. And in my country, we are a developing country and we are not that much rich technically. And uh, before um, COVID-19 pandemic time, uh, the adolescents uh, did not have, uh, most of the adolescents did not have any so, uh, Facebook or Instagram, social media. Uh, but uh, in this time, we are doing online classes and uh, uh, many students are um, coping up this situation by online. And we are also uh, want to um, be cope up with the situation we are, uh, doing many webinars like this uh, so that they can uh, connect with us uh, thus they can uh, the way they they are doing their classes they can do their uh, club basis and talk shows uh, many influencers are talking about uh, nutrition and all of this with them and they are being connected and we are want to make them awake that no no don't be upset don't be uh, down. Yes, good days are coming soon, uh, but stay safe uh, in your home and we are together. We are, uh, we are not socially uh, distanced. We have a physical distance, but not social distance, actually. So that is it. We are trying to cook up, but uh, the situation is really hampered for COVID-19. And Titi, you, are, you mentioned um, influencers in your country or locality taking it on board themselves to do something about the issue. Um, Tasha, Webster, Dipti, what do you need all the people listening, both nationally and internationally, to do to help further adolescent nutrition? And what you specifically are trying to accomplish?
Um, so for me, it's quite similar to what Dipti say um, in terms of like getting influencers to actually help the cause. Um, it's almost similar to what we're trying to do at Bike Back, but in reverse, in that we're asking for influencers to not, you know, endorse um, junk food advertising on their platforms. Because a lot of the time you find that, you know, your favorite influencer is, in, you know, is doing a sponsored post uh, by McDonald's or another big franchise. And that's working against what we're trying to do because that normalizes the consumption of these kind of foods. So for us, it's about, okay, using um, those that do have platforms um, whether those are adults and or other social media influencers, how can you use your platform to educate about um, on nutrition? Um, similar to what everyone has said so far, I didn't everything that I know about nutrition, I did not learn it at school. It was me having to go out and actually find out for myself. And the more I found out, the more angry I got. And then I stumbled into fight back. So everything kind of worked out that way. But for me, a lot of it has been taking up upon myself to actually do the work. And I don't think that should be the case. This kind of information should be really accessible. And I think influencers or anybody else that has any form of platform or, or reach, they have a moral responsibility to use it in a way that helps everybody and that um, encourages healthy living and healthy lifestyles. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, I was I I am agree with Chasha, and um, you know uh, we uh, the adolescents uh, mostly follow the influencer, and if we can uh, show them the influencer uh, like your favorite act actor uh, don't leave uh, eating only burger or pizza, uh, he or she has to eat apple in his break in break, breakfast and healthy foods and if she come to um, come to uh, in front of all of us and say this the adolescents um, uh, have the uh, have this impact on them mostly actually and uh, it can be a, a webinar it can be a talk show it can be a face-to-face uh, uh, um, -face talk show with uh, our adolescents and our influencer and the it can be in online or offline anything so they they have a special impact impact on the um, adolescents Yeah, um, for me, I think uh, the call to action, or I think what I would expect people both nationally and internationally to do will be to take up what I would like to call the relaying approach, you know, like when people are running in a race and they have to part, pass the button to the to the next space. I think that's exactly what we, we need to do. We do understand that um, we have um, a group of older people that are older than us. And they need to understand that we are going to be the next uh, batch of older people. So they need to pass on the button to us, tell us the challenges that um, they have faced, and we tell them the challenges that we think we're most likely to face if we turn up to be adults like them. And then once we, we get to do that, we, both them and us will be on, on the same footing, and then we can try to make map out a way forward that is better, not for them, not for us, but for the children that are gonna come after us. I think I emphasized this before, I'm very excited to be a future father, yay. <laughs> and um, one thing that I'm trying to, to accomplish is uh, just as Tasha is fighting on the issue of, of junk food here in Zimbabwe, there's a concept I'm really trying to build, but it's mainly focusing on mainstreaming indigenous food items. Because now, especially if you look at Sub-Saharan um, Africa, we have had, especially if you look in the news, I can speak for my country, but we've, we've had a series of droughts and, and hunger and stuff like that. And then most of the of the hunger is, is caused not necessarily because uh, there is not food, but then there's a certain type of food that people would want to eat and that food is not there. And uh, most of the food uh, is, um, you know, um, Western, uh, you know, influenced type, type of diet. And people usually neglect the local food items. So then people were shortage of maize because our step was sadza. Then they start commenting about shortage of maize to make sadza, but they have other alternatives like sorghum and rapoko, which are which they're not utilizing because they're they are not uh, mainstream. Yet. So that's basically what I'm trying to to accomplish so that people will stop crying over maize and look at other outer, you know, and look at other alternatives that are out there, but then are not being um, 
utilized enough. It, it goes back to the issue Tacho was saying about how food, food is advertised in the TV. You know, most of the food that we see, we see it uh, uh, from the television sets and all in Zimbabwe only have one TV station. So that means the other TV stations we see from other countries and, 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 and online, you know. So we then want to, you know, eat that kind of food that we see on the, on the telly, but then neglect uh, our own local uh, available foods. Yeah. So that's also one thing I was uh, I'm mainly focusing on. And when Sophie talked about cooking demonstrations, those are some of the food items that we're actually preparing and making sure the young people get accustomed to them and start eating them so that when they turn into parents as well, they can make their children uh, start eating those foods because our parents are not eating them now, but the certain influence that came and made, them, and made them stop eating those kind of foods. But then now we want to take back our foods and, uh, and eat it back. Yeah, thank you. I see Emily has her video on. Is our time up? <laughs> uh, in a couple of minutes, yes. Just wanted to give a bit of warning. If there's anything, anything last, last few words anybody wants to share. I might squish two questions together and maybe you can give really quick inputs, um, Tasha Webster and Dipti. Um, how do you actually engage with policymakers? Because I know when I was lobbying, I lobbied for a year and a lot of times I would just get no answer or a really quick, this isn't my area, sorry, uh, kind of responses. Um, and within that question, I'm also going to ask you, what is me what does meaningful participation mean to you? Really quickly, <laughs> if you can. Yeah, so really quickly, going back to the point of social media, um, some people the younger generation will be quite familiar with almost like cancel culture. So we've been able to essentially call out policymakers um, when they when they don't do what they're supposed to do, or really just encourage them to do something. There's something about public perception and reputation that policies policymakers try and keep up with. And so when you're having a group of young people calling calling them out that hey you're doing you've done this and it's wrong, that almost prompts a reaction um, from them. And in terms of um, the second part of your question um for me do, 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 i don't have an answer at the moment okay i think uh for me when it comes to the issue of um engaging with uh policy makers i think being a law student is a is a plus because i then get to understand how uh the legislature works and how to approach them and and, and stuff like that but then, uh, for me, I think I found that um, approaching policymakers towards election time is very useful and powerful. But the, the disadvantage to that is uh, election time is usually five, five, four, three years, usually long time. But I found that it's very effective to you know approach legislators um, uh, nearing the election time. So what you can do in the in the other four or five years prior to the elections, you can maybe build up what you want to say or make make your package so that you then deliver get towards election time, they'll definitely uh, listen to you. And for me, I think meaningful, meaningful participation is uh, participation with, with results. I take it as seeding, you know, like meaningful planting. If you plant a seed, you expect results. So planting a seed does not, you know, it means nothing if the seed does not come up. So that's the same thing with me, with meaningful participation. If I participate in something, I expect to see results. If I don't see results, the same as if I didn't participate at all. And any quick remarks from Dipti before we I hand it back over to Emily? I think we might have just lost Dipti. If I quickly Oh, oh no, there she is. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I'm sorry for uh, it it was a network trouble. Um yeah, uh, my in my mind, participation means this webinar that it is for the adolescents and they are listening from us but in every section in we don't see see this and we that's why we have a generation gap between the policy makers and the adolescents or the young people and i think we should uh, listen from uh, them what they want what the way they want and then we have to make a policy or system for them and uh, in my uh, to me participation means 
yeah, you have to listen, listen from me that what I deserve, what I need, what I uh, think of. Sorry, Sophie, if I can just jump in really quickly. Um, yeah, no, the reason why I'm really just conflicted with what does meaningful participation mean? Uh, I mentioned it earlier, sometimes it's almost like a tick box exercise and it's quite difficult to kind of discern when a company really cares um, about what you have to say and when a company is just, you know, again, just doing it for the sake of, I don't know, uh, public perception. And so it's almost like, I don't know how to engage with you when I'm not able to decipher how genuine and authentic it is. And I think for young people nowadays, it's very much about authenticity. Like how much do you care? Does it genuinely, do you genuinely believe in this cause? Do you genuinely have, um, you know, all the desire to change my life really? Like it's enough for you to listen to me. Like there's, you know, panels like this happen all the time and young people are invited onto it. But then like Webster said, nothing really happens, nothing takes place. So for me, it's quite difficult. As long as they, you know, meaningful participation, I guess it's about authenticity, but how you decipher that can be quite difficult. Yeah, I think the heart of it is open and honest conversations. And if we're not afraid to criticize the people in charge and they're not afraid of our criticism, um, I think what Webster was saying about the action can come from that. Um, and I think you really hit the nail on the head and I think everybody did and I've actually learned quite a lot from this conversation I love these open and honest conversations that we have been able to have today and I just want to thank again uh, Tasha Webster and Dipsty for um, coming on here and chatting with me and also ENN for hosting us and um, back to Emily. Thank you, Sophie. And yes, huge thanks, Tasha, Dipti, Webster. Um, I don't know if you can see in the chat box, but there's uh, an enormous amount of uh, lovely comments coming about how inspiring you all are, how interesting, how, how much we have to listen to you, but not just listen, then translate that into the action that's that's needed. Um, so unfortunately, we have to end here because we have kept everybody on Zoom for quite a long time today. But we do have a part two going on tomorrow. Um, sadly, not with the young people, although I'm hoping they might join us as well. Um, but we've got some really interesting um, presentations tomorrow. We've got something about adolescents' experience of food, um, some really interesting research that's gone on. We've also, Lynette Neufeld is going to give us a highlight a quick tour of the Lancet mini series that's coming up on adolescent nutrition so we can hear about that and then we have got another panel um, but this is with um, some government representatives and some organizational representatives um, so hopefully it will be as interesting and inspiring as today has been and we really look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow but thank you everybody for joining us we've really enjoyed it goodbye <laughs>